<laughs> so I remember actually seeing a less wrong article uh, uh, of a couple of years ago where there's a speck of dust, like a tiny speck of dust. Yeah. And it's like, it hits the eyes of like a giant number of people. And you can choose between that and torturing one individual and that person will have a terrible life. But the, the one instance where the speck of dust hits the eyes of like Giant well, there is, this, there is this famous moving remark by Dostoevsky about bringing happiness to millions at the cost of torturing one child. Um, now, the case is different if doing what will inflict suffering on one child will save very many other children from as much or more suffering. But I also think that remark isn't relevant to the answer that I was giving. Um, I mean, here's another point. The problem with effective altruism, the problem that effective altruism faces, I should say, is the nature of the causal connection between we rich people and the two billion people who live on less than two dollars a day. If the causal connections could be rearranged so that each of we rich people is the only person who could benefit or harm some particular poor person, the problem would be solved. Of course, we would happily give up quite a lot of our wealth if that particular child who can be helped only by me will be me. The problem entirely arises because instead of each being able to make a big difference to one person, all of us together can make a difference to very many people but in a way that's so slight and so dispersed that it doesn't erase our natural human sympathy. Um, okay, um, and I think um, Dostoevsky's remark isn't really relevant to the difference between these two ways of harming people, doing it directly or doing it indirectly. Um, and I think people would also like to know your email. So email oh yes, um, my email is d e r e k dot. P A R F I T dot. No, not dot. P A R F I T. Then at. And then the, the following is the only complicated bit. A double L hyphen S O U L S dot. O X dot A C dot U K. So it's A double L hyphen S O U L S. And then from there on dot A C dot O K. Okay. Um, next question from Slido. Um, could you comment on how your revisiting of the triviality problem impacts on abortion? Uh, it doesn't apply to abortion. Um, make one remark about abortion. I got rather sidetracked for 20 years. I assumed that I was going to go on working on substantive moral and evaluative problems, but I got so disturbed by the views about normative truths that other people had, that I felt I just had to turn aside and try and rebut them. Um, and remind me what the question was? I was about to make a remark about it. Yep, uh, could you comment on how your revisiting of the triviality problem impacts on abortion? Oh, yes, yes, good. It's an indirect connection. When people say there are no moral truths, no normative truths, they often appeal to the fact that there's so much disagreement. And far and away, the most common example they give is the disagreement about abortion. That doesn't threaten the belief that there are fundamental normative truths, because abortion is a borderline case. You'd expect people would disagree about borderline cases. Um, so what I'm saying doesn't really apply to abortion. 
The pity is that people haven't realized that being a human being and being a person shouldn't be regarded as something that's all or nothing. When an acorn starts sprouting green shoots, it's not an oak tree, it slowly becomes an oak tree. Um, that, I think, is what's most relevant to abortion. But the main point is that in the case of abortion, there's wholly understandable disagreement about when a child, an unborn child, becomes a member of the moral community. And that's a different kind of problem. Yes. So how does your position avoid the repugnant conclusion? I think um, that's a longish story. Um, I think myself that we should defend what I call a strong lexical superiority. We should say that in some cases there are at least two kinds of things that are good the higher goods and the lower goods. And I believe that the lower goods have non-diminishing marginal value. The more of them there are, the better things are. But no amount of the lower goods could be as good as the higher goods. That's lexical superiority. And to defend lexical superiority, I think one thing we need to do is to give up the idea that there are precise truths about what's better or worse than others. If you think there are precise truths, it's very hard to defend lexical superiority because you're driven to the view that there must be some precise point at which suddenly a new moral status arises. I think that's a deep mistake. I think we can avoid the repugnant conclusion in that way. Um, we can say, well, it's, it's good if a primitive herbivore is munching grass or a lizard is basking in the sun, and the more lizards that bask in the sun, the better. But no number of lizards basking in the sun could be as good as what some human beings' existence can be. So that's how it would have to go. Um, most people who consider lexical views say, as I myself once did, that they only seem superficially defensible if they're about things that are in two quite different categories. The example I gave is Cardinal Newman's rather terrifying view that sin is bad and pain is bad, but sin is infinitely worse. So if all mankind suffered agony, that would be less bad than if one venial sin was committed. Well, I don't accept that view, but you sort of understand it because sin and pain are just in quite different categories. I think we need to defend a similar view about the best things that can happen and very minor goods. And we have to do it by challenging the whole idea that there must be precise truths, so this view is going to have to draw sharp, arbitrary line. Um, but that's a long story. Yeah. Do you think user interface designers for software have this kind of responsibility? Um, I'm not sure why designers of software. Um, Anders, maybe you could clarify. Someone explain that. Yes, I mean, uh, another obvious point I should have made is that in very many cases, rather than our act being very slightly worse for very, very many people, the act runs a risk of being one of the acts that makes a bigger difference to some people. Um, similar remarks apply to very small risks uh, as they do to very small benefits and harms. But those are more familiar. 
um, so I wasn't discussing them. Now, I, I'm not quite sure what you had in mind with the computers, but how do they make a difference to say the problems created by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere? How, how are computers relevant? Yes, um, I think I partly get that, not wholly, but yeah. Okay, um, and I think in, we'll take a few more questions if that's okay. Um, so if we could increase the lives of all people ever to exist by one fraction of a minute, or double one person's <laughs> life, what should we do? Surely the continuity of all, pleasure. Yeah, um, start again. So, yeah? If we could increase the lives of all people ever to exist by one fraction of a minute, or double one person's life, what should we do? Surely the continuity of pleasure is worth more than the individual sum of its parts. Well, that's like my case, in which you imagine that you could give one person a whole year of life, or give each of very many people one more minute of life. Now, that's precisely where people say, well, obviously, you should give someone a whole year of life. Giving people one more minute is just irrelevant, it's mm -hmm. trivial. But I point out that if a community of a million people could treat each other in either of these ways, if they chose giving one more minute rather than a whole year, they'd give everyone not one year, but two years of life. So, um, I think those examples are perfectly robust. Um, things add up. Uh, the mistake we make is failing to realize that very small effects on very many people come out as great. Let me give you another example. I'm very bad at mathematics, but I did publish one two-page paper um, of a semi-mathematical kind. Many political scientists, uh, when they're discussing why people vote, which they find rather a puzzle, given their assumptions about motivation, they say, well, you know, even if you're an act consequentialist, you couldn't justify voting. That's wrong, and the reason that it's wrong is that if you're in one of the marginal states, it's more complicated in America. It's better if you've got a single poll and the person who wins. Your chance of making a difference to who wins the election is something like one in 300 million. It's extremely small. But if your vote makes the difference and a better president is elected, that president will be the president of 300 million Americans. The two large numbers just cancel out. Um, so we're bad at small chances and trivial effects. We don't give them the weight they should have. Okay, um, and the last question we'll take. How have your conclusions on the triviality problem with regards to imperceptible suffering affected your own personal actions? I don't think They've affected my own action, but that's because I've always had these views since I can remember. So I can't remember changing my views. Uh, uh, I, I'd love to have a quick opinion poll. How many of you, I mean, as I say, I hoped uh, that people would accept the no difference view. Yes, if we cause much lower quality of life and our act kills many people, doesn't make any difference that we know it'll be worse for no one. But alas, very many people, I think it does make a difference and they care less about the effects of their acts on the further future. 
since I've actually rather blatantly said which way I think you ought to vote, <laughs> let me just ask you more optimistic. How many people accept the no difference view? Uh, the no difference view says that when you realize that your policies will greatly lower the quality of life of future people and kill many people, you thought that was a pretty strong argument against them, then you realize that because of the non-identity problem, your policies won't be worse for any of the future people. And on the no difference view, that doesn't make any difference. Your moral reason not to do it is just as strong. And I'm now suggesting the reason that it's just as strong, and this actually applies more easily to benefits than to harms, the reason it's just as strong is that yes, it's not going to be worse for people, but it's much less good for people than the other policy would have been. Now, so that's the difference. Um, I won't have another poll, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Can you join me in thanking um, Derek Parfit for speaking today?